get started here, I want to give a little bit of a heads up that this video is going to be my, uh, my most personal video yet, and it deals with some stuff that's a little heavy. Uh, specifically, it's going to discuss childhood illness and some medical stuff. Uh, nothing too extreme or graphic, so don't worry about that, but if that's something that you aren't comfortable with or just don't want to hear, I totally understand, and thank you for understanding, too. In the summer of 1998, I was a four-year-old kid whose only experience with video games had been some educational ones. Uh, Putt Putt Saves the Zoo, Spy Fox in Dry Cereal, and Pajama Sam No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside were my favorite games at the time, and I'd play them a lot and then replay them after I finished them. I was just doing as most four-year-olds do, having fun and not caring about anything. But uh, one morning when I woke up, my first thought of the day was the fact that my family and I were going to go visit the local zoo, which I loved doing and didn't always get the chance to. Uh, something was very wrong with me, though. Uh, truth be told, I don't remember the specific feeling I had, but I do remember sitting by the front door waiting to leave and just being hunched over and staring at the floor. Uh, for the first time in my life, I told my mom that I didn't want to go to the zoo and that I felt awful. After that memory, uh, the next thing I can jump to from that day is getting blood drawn and then staring up at one of those bright uh, circular examination lights and thinking that it looked like a UFO, which is a comparison of the time that I'm sure came from cartoons, uh, while my parents on my left talked to my doctor on the right. Uh, I had no idea what they were talking about. I don't know if it's my memory or just not understanding since I was so young, but uh, at the end of the day, I was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, uh, which is a blood cancer that essentially forces the production of an excessive and unhealthy amount of immature white blood cells and can be fatal in a few weeks to a few months if it's left untreated. Luckily, in my case, it was caught early, and I started chemotherapy treatment pretty much right away. I know this kind of goes without saying, but I was really lucky to be born when I was because the survival rate of kids with ALL was rising at that time thanks to the standardization of chemotherapy treatment. Uh, the survival rate was high if it was caught early, which mine was, and as of 2015, the survival rate is now 90%, and that's incredible and makes me really happy. I received intramuscular chemotherapy, which was typically given through an injection in my leg, but I also had to have what's called a port embedded in my chest, which is essentially a direct passage into a vein, and it was necessary because chemotherapy can be damaging to tissue and skin if it's injected that way a lot. Uh, basically, it was this big, hard bump underneath the skin in my upper right chest, and I still have a big scar there from when they put it in and put it out, or took it out. And it's actually a lot more sensitive than the rest of my chest, too, if I put pressure on it, which I've always found is really interesting because it's been so many years uh, since it was removed. Uh, I went through chemo for four years before I entered a complete remission and didn't require the treatment anymore, so that bump was there for four years of my life. My life after my diagnosis was basically broken up into two activities, which was staying at home and going to the clinic or the hospital. I wasn't really able to go anywhere else because of my poor immune system, especially not anywhere with other kids around because they're germ factories. Uh, so I had to be homeschooled until second grade in between the medical visits. Now at this point, and honestly maybe even the first 10 seconds of the video, you might be wondering how the hell Sonic the Hedgehog of all things fits into any of this, and you're very right at wondering that. Uh, multiple times a week, I would visit the clinic to receive the treatment and also get a spinal tap so that my bone marrow, which is where the leukemia cells start to be made before spreading, uh, could be checked. Uh, in case you're wondering if that hurt at all, uh, it did sometimes, and the doctor was very clear about stopping if I said it did, but it was definitely helped by the fact that I was high as a kite during it. I used to call it nummy medicine and ask if I could take some home with me, which is pretty funny in hindsight. But anyway, after each treatment and or spinal tap, there was this big red chest in one of the rooms of the clinic. 
Uh, myself and the other kids suffering from similar illnesses were given a key to this chest after each appointment, and we'd open it and see that it was full of small toys, and we were able to pick something out of it and take it home just to make sure that each trip wasn't an entirely awful experience. But in the middle of that same room were two chairs across from a big black box that we used to call a TV in the 90s on one of those uh, carts with wheels, if you know what I'm talking about. And plugged into that TV was a Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive if you're not from North America, with a Sonic the Hedgehog 2 cartridge in it. At the clinic, there was a social worker named Tom, and I just thought Tom was the coolest guy ever. He was fun and easy to talk to, which was obviously his job, so of course he was. But as a kid, you don't really realize stuff like that. You just get told that this is Tom, and then you have a new friend. And that's truly what Tom felt like to me every time I visited the clinic, a big reason of that being because we got to play at least a level or two of Sonic the Hedgehog 2 together, which I, I realized this when I thought back on it years later, was my first time playing a video game with another person, and that's a pretty meaningful experience when it's such a big hobby of yours. We would always do the two-player race mode, and I specifically remember playing through Mystic Cave Zone a lot. Uh, unfortunately for my house-ridden self, I didn't own a Sega Genesis, just a PlayStation, so as far as I was concerned, Sonic only existed at the clinic. That is, of course, until we moved to a new place and got Cable for the first time, which revealed to me the wonder that was the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. I loved this cartoon, you don't understand. I asked my parents to extend my bedtime by 30 minutes just so I could watch it. It was that good. I felt confident enough to do that. It was your typical 90s Saturday morning cartoon, or in my case, weekday night cartoon, uh, complete with a public service announcement segment in the middle of each episode to tell you that smoking is bad and to know your home phone number if you get lost, which is definitely not something that kids really need to worry about anymore, but anyway... Uh, it was a great show for a kid that liked Sonic, and Sonic was voiced by Jaleel White, too. Uh, there were other shows I saw and would rent videos from Blockbuster to watch, like Sonic Sad AM, or Sad Am. I'm not sure how you're supposed to pronounce that one, since it's a fan term, but hey. Uh, and I used to also watch the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. Uh, no, not that one. This one, the anime OVA. But I didn't really get my true Sonic fix until I was lucky enough to get my hands on a Sega Dreamcast and its best launch title, at least in my opinion, Sonic Adventure. Uh, going by pure technicality, it wasn't Sonic's first 3D game, but I would argue that it was his first proper 3D game. I've always liked saying that Sonic Adventure is to Sonic what Super Mario 64 was to Mario. It was a much, much jankier game than Mario 64, but I didn't know any better, and you know what? I still don't know any better because I still love playing this game 20 years later. Uh, Sonic is still as fast as you want him to be, but now he's able to explore levels and fight bosses with the homing attack, which is a really smart addition to make it more fun to play in 3D. Uh, this game was really ambitious to me. I'm pretty confident that Sonic Adventure was the first game I played that let you choose multiple characters. And it really went all in with it. It let you pick from six of them. All of them played differently, and they all had a unique perspective on the same storyline. On top of that, at least to me, uh, Sonic looked exactly like they'd taken his original sprite and just moved the camera instead of keeping it side-scrolling. I have a really strong appreciation for the way that Sonic Adventure looks on the Dreamcast, which unfortunately was not carried over very much to the GameCube port called Sonic Adventure Director's Cut, but we don't have to get into that now. When you're four or five years old, sorry, I just knocked the microphone, but when you're four or five years old, you don't really think about why you're having so much fun with the game you're playing, but I think one of the things that really made me fall in love with Sonic 2 over other side-scrolling games was just how fast you got to go in it with the momentum mechanics, and they definitely nailed the perfect amount of speed in Sonic's jump to 3D, while also giving you levels that were a ton of fun to fully explore and find alternate pathways through. It felt like a a bigger, mind-blowing, better version of Sonic 2 to me, and I played it over and over and over again while I was still sick. The, this game solidified my love for the blue blur. Uh, once I had been in remission long enough for the cancer to be fully considered gone, uh, my chemotherapy was stopped, and I was finally able to, at eight years old, 
start doing what everyone else my age was doing, which was going to school and learning with a bunch of other kids. Uh, making friends was, as you might imagine, a little tough at first and was honestly something I struggled with a lot throughout most of my years at school. I don't know if I want to say that it was hard for me socially, but I always felt a bit of a disconnect with kids my age, like a general lack of seeing eye to eye, which I figure might be due to the fact that I only interacted with adults for the most part for my very formative years as a kid, but I digress. I still had friends, and one of the first close friends I made when I first started going to school was because of Sonic Adventure 2, uh, which came out a few years after Adventure 1. I'd overheard him talking to some of his friends about playing the game that I clearly recognized as that one, and I chimed in saying how much I liked it too and was instantly welcomed into that group, and it was a great feeling. I spent a ton of time with this friend. We'd go over to each other's places really often and just take turns playing Sonic Adventure 2, talking about our favorite parts of the game and how cool we thought Shadow was or something equally silly. Uh, there were quite a few group hangouts too, and a lot of video games were played on those nights, but Adventure 2 was almost always one of them. Uh, and now that I'm thinking about it, that reminds me. Uh, that friend also got a black Labrador puppy around this time too, and can you guess what his family let him name it? You guessed correctly, it was Shadow. I'm getting a little carried away on tangents now, but what I'm trying to get at is that I've been a Sonic fan pretty much all of my life. He was a favorite character of mine for years and years, and I've spent a decent amount of time wondering why he resonated with me so much. And I don't, at, at the risk of sounding overly dramatic and reading too much into it, I think his attitude as a character is what really drew me to him at that point in my life. He's always been snarky, overconfident, and stylish, but he's also a good friend and a good person who can do amazing things, beat the bad guy, and then go to spend his days killing time and just enjoying the simple things in life. He's basically a lovable superhero, and while that may not be much to some people, to a sick kid in the 90s, he was what I wanted to be able to be, and I think that's what stuck with me the most. I think... Even if it was mostly subconsciously, when I was in a hospital bed or sitting in an exam room, when I got better, I wanted to be like Sonic. And that feeling still sort of hits me as an adult, at least partially. I still buy and play every new Sonic game at launch, even if I don't entirely love everything about the direction that the series took after the adventure games. It's still Sonic to me, and I'm still grateful to be able to experience new stories with him. And even if they've all been pretty lackluster since Sonic Generations in 2011, I can't help but remember my time as a little kid playing those games and feel pretty lucky that 20 years later I'm still able to have fun with a new Sonic game. And I think that's really all I have to say. Uh, I just want to thank you for listening to me talk about this all the way through. It means the world to me to be able to express these thoughts out loud and share them with you. I am a very emotional person, and it was a pretty emotional experience reminding myself about all of this and then saying it out loud for the first time in a video, but I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. Uh, my original inspiration for talking about this came from the fact that my next playthrough is going to be Sonic Adventure, my next ASMR playthrough. And I know that there was just a little bit too much history and sentiment behind it for me, to, for me specifically to accurately represent how much the game means to me while also playing and recording it. And I just wanted to, I don't know, it just felt good to talk about this and express it a little bit before we go into that playthrough. But anyway, uh, that's all from me now. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate you. Take care of yourself. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.